So I'm speaking today on the, I'm going to call it the C bill because I quite like the double meaning. C-E-E -E is quite difficult to say. So I'm going to suggest that maybe we can call this the C bill and maybe we can enjoy the double meanings that are there because there's something about seeing our situation more clearly. And there's something also about the C as in S-E-A that we need to be global in our approach. So I think we can enjoy those double meanings. And I'm going to attempt today a theological and faith response to this bill, uh, which has actually just finally, it's been finally sort of printed. And I would encourage you all to go online and have a look at it uh, in more depth after this talk. Um, so, okay, let me just move forward. There we are. Now I'm going to start where David left us um, very helpfully. Thank you, David, last week. David gave us this really helpful picture, I think, of um, how do we understand uh, the change that we're wanting to bring about, this struggle for change. And he gave us these four quadrants. And on one side, we've got sort of business as usual um, and where that might just carry on as is, which we know it just can't. And then how there is an attempt now to address climate change through Build Back Better and Green New Deal. But we could say that these ways of bringing about change are largely working within the system as is. That actually these are attempts to kind of carry on business as usual, but to reduce emissions within it. And then on the other side, we've got the more drastic, what happens if this whole thing collapses? So you've got a kind of survivalism mentality. Let's just get our bunkers ready, those of us that can. Let's go off grid. Let's just focus on surviving. But what David also, we started talking about is this fourth lower quadrant, the resilience model. Is there deeper system change that we might wanna think about? And what does that look like? Now, I'm wondering whether you're gonna be able to see my little diagram. You might need to reduce your boxes for this little bit because I want to introduce some extra bits into this diagram. Uh, and just to say at the end, we also talked about, well, where does CCA sit? And we felt maybe we sit somewhere across these two models of change. Something about, we don't want to just reject the Build Back Better Green New Deal approach, but actually we're also, desiring and seeking deeper change. So to look at this model again, I want to bring up this other, we talked to some people thought they weren't very happy with the word resilience. And so some people sort of wanted to think about this, um, this word revolution, revolution. And I think I just want to say, so I've put there kind of, it's almost on its own. Um, and uh, it crosses maybe the ego stuff and the communal stuff. But I think, I just want to say that revolution is probably a form of change that's, that happens very quickly. So a revolution is, is in a sense, it's like we get rid of the old and we replace it. So revolutions, they're not evolution. They're not a gradual um, process. They're a rapid process. And because of that, there's always danger of violence with revolution. And I think also there is also a danger of binary thinking of saying old bad, new good. So we just get rid of the old and we replace it. And you could say that an example of that would be Roger Hallam and where he's gone in his thinking. I don't know if any of you have read Common Sense for the 21st Century. You can download it off the internet. Roger um, published it in August, 2019. But basically where Roger's gone is he's now saying we need to overthrow the government through civil disobedience and we need to basically replace the government with a citizens assembly. So I would argue that is an example of revolutionary thinking. And there are some dangers with that. It's problematic. Um, I think it's in danger of just saying, if we just take away 500 years of evolved democracy for all of its problems and just seek to replace it with a citizens assembly, how do we know that's gonna be any better? You know, it's too simplistic. Um, outside of Roger, I think the dangers of revolution are always gonna be utopianism. So as a Christian, I'm wary of utopian thinking. Um, and I think as environmentalists, 
we have to also wrestle with the dangers of eco-totalitarianism or eco-fascism because climate change and ecological, ecological devastation is so urgent, we can be tempted to eco-totalitarianism. We've just got to do this by any means possible. You know, if it means totalitarianism, that's the way. And there is a danger um, with this thinking. I think for Christians, the ends never justify the means because the means are the end. You know, how we get there is vital. And so we can't just instrumentalize nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. You know, for us, it's not just a tactic. It's actually who we're called to be. It's our permanent spiritual reality. And the other reason that I'm cautious about this word revolution is I think there's something about that we need to hold on to complexity. We have to resist all forms of fundamentalism and ideology. There is an arrogance in thinking that we know the answer. You know, reality, this problem is probably the most complex, massive problem humanity has ever faced because it involves every single aspect of how we live and how we see the world. It's massively complex. And there is no one simple solution, if only there were, to this problem. And it therefore requires humility. And I think it requires we hold on to complexity. We say this is massively complex and there is no one simple solution. However, we have another revolution as Christians that we do believe in. And that is the revolution of God. So the revolution in the red box, I would say, is the human revolution. But as Christians, we are invited into the revolution of God's kingdom. And it is absolutely revolutionary because it turns the world upside down, inside out. God invites us to see things in a fundamentally different way. We're called to a completely different way of living being and seeing. However, this revolution, unfortunately, we can't legislate for it and we can't impose it through violence. So we are, we're part of a revolution. You know, let's say it loud and clear. The kingdom of God is revolutionary. But actually, what does it mean for us to, um, to see that, to be part of it? Well, I would say that we have, this is some um, sort of classical language about the kingdom of God, is that we're called to be a sign and an instrument and a foretaste of that kingdom. That we're never gonna see it completely without God doing it, but we are called in this world to be a sign, to be an instrument of it, to be a foretaste of it. And I think this speaks across all of the boxes, actually. <laughs> you know, the kingdom of God isn't just limited to one of the boxes, it speaks to all of them. Um, but perhaps particularly, I would say it speaks to that fourth box, which talks about deeper system change, that actually the kingdom of God is about seeding new forms into the old. So that while the old is dying, the new is emerging. And that is where we might want to think about really directing our energy. And the CEE bill, I would suggest also equally sits across those two models of change. It, it relates to the Build Back Better and the Green New Deal, but it also relates very powerfully to deeper change. And that's why I think the C bill is something that we really, really want to get behind and get involved in as Christians. So that's kind of looking at the bigger picture and how we understand. Um, and I know that that will be very debatable and controversial, but that's my sort of a, a perspective on how we might wanna see our role in change. So why the sea bill? Well, I think one of the most important things about it is it gets the fact that we're in an emergency. It really says that we need urgent, radical change. And that most of the change that's going on in that Green New Deal box isn't radical and it isn't urgent enough. So the Green New Deal, it brings emissions, climate change and ecology together. It says the two have to be held together. You cannot separate them. So we need to play our fair role in limiting global emissions to 1.5 and that will require 
very radical action but it also has a very active approach to ecology rather than just seeing oh it's great because we can tackle climate change and that also involves you know looking after biodiversity the sea bill takes a more active urgent um, view of actually that we need to positively uh, enhance and conserve our ecological world and then thirdly it brings in a citizens assembly because it says given the speed and the scale of the change we can't just let par parliament um, can't do this by itself but it needs citizens to engage so we don't end up in the kind of yellow vest situation of France so we need a citizens assembly to be part of this process so the sea bill gets the urgency um, I think one of the challenges, and I would say that this is probably the new battleground, because I think climate change is on the agenda, and it's going to be increasingly on the agenda. Everyone's going to be jumping on the bandwagon. There are already thousands of organisations out there. You know, Boris Johnson, um, Biden, <laughs> hooray, Biden, you know, they're all, they're all massively going to be in the Green New Deal, green change box. So everyone's coming on board, people. The real issue is the scale and the urgency. That's the new battleground as I see it um, with, with the change we need to see. So why is the sea bill, sorry, I'm going really fast. I have to apologize, but otherwise we're gonna run out of time. So I'm just gonna rattle through this, um, but I would just say, go back and look at this um, yourselves. So why is it groundbreaking? And I've taken this all off their website. So it's all there. So number one, global fairness. In the Paris Agreement, there is a principle which is called common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities. Okay, a bit of a mouthful. But it's the principle that those nations that industrialized first and are more socially and economically able to address this issue need to take the lion's share at the beginning. We've got to act faster and we've got to take more of the burden on because we've caused it and we've got more capacity. However, it's all just a principle and nobody is really enacting this. So the, where the C bill is groundbreaking is it puts it into law. It makes it a legal requirement that we take a much bigger share uh, of emissions than we're currently doing. Uh, secondly, radically, or it shouldn't be radical, but it is, it includes consumption emissions. And that means at the moment, the government's only measuring what we produce in the UK. It isn't it's not measuring 40, the 46% of our emissions that come through all the consumer goods that we import in. Because as, you know, as a largely post-industrial society, we've exported the production of our goods and our lifestyle to abroad. If we don't count it, it's deeply unfair to those countries which consume less but produce more for us. So part of the radical justice and fairness is we have to measure what we consume. And that has quite far reaching implications. It also measures uh, shipping and aviation and travel abroad, which currently are also not being counted. So this is a much um, more complete way and fair way of measuring our emissions. Um, it prioritizes natural climate solutions. So that's all the ways that nature holds and captures carbons. So peatlands, bogs, wetlands, forests. And it says, we've got to prioritize these this is the way through um, and what it downsizes or it doesn't it wants to avoid at all costs is negative emissions technologies these are the kind of forms of you know carbon capture geoengineering doing mad stuff in the oceans now these negative emission technologies are largely speculative uh, we don't yet know if we can do them at scale and we don't really know what the other uh, side effects are going to be of these negative emissions technologies. So really this bill says we want to try and avoid those. Now at the moment in the climate change and in most countries kind of um, climate targets, these play a massive role. So we're, we're kind of hoping that things that we don't really know yet what we're doing are gonna solve this problem for us. We can kind of carry on as business as usual because we can trust in these nets. However, the bill is realistic because it says there are certain areas of our economy, agriculture, cement, steel, that we can't or probably are not gonna be able to reduce emissions by the time scale needed to avoid 1.5. So the bill does allow for the use of nets where there's no other option. So in that sense, the bill is realistic. 
right? It recognizes that we might have to use some of them, but we, we're gonna be really scrutinizing it. And we're certainly not seeing it as the main way to address this problem. The bill is really positive about the necessity, the intrinsic value of the abundance and health of ecosystems, that that's non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. And that we need to look beyond just our own country in terms of the damage we're doing. So not only does it count our global emissions that that happen beyond our country, it also says we've got to look at the damage we're doing ecologically in our supply chains, all those goods that we are enjoying, the true cost of those, both to workers, but also to the ecological systems that are involved. So where forests are being cut down, where mining is causing ecological devastation. And that we need a citizens assembly if we're gonna do this. So this bill allows for a citizens assembly, um, which is really important. So those are all the ways in which this bill is groundbreaking. So what resonates theologically with this? Um, so first of all, I think there's something about telling the truth that this bill, we're still largely, even though everyone's got climate change on their lips, I think we're still largely in denial about the scale and speed of action required. Yeah, telling the truth is not just the figures, because um, the figures, are, well, it's difficult, isn't it? But uh, if we really look at the science, what scientists are telling us is that no one is addressing this with the speed and urgency. So there's something here about telling the truth. There's also something fundamental about justice, about global fairness, about the fact that we have to take responsibility for what we've done historically. The, the, the UK is in the top three of total overall emitters historically because we were the first to industrialize. We're up there with the big guys, you know. Um, and moral leadership. There's something here about we have an opportunity for moral leadership. And as Christians, we want our country to take a moral leadership. There's something here about deeper systemic change that actually what this bill um, leads us to is, to is to different values, to different measures of prosperity, to questions about what is true well-being, and questions of lifestyle. So the bill um, actually takes us into deeper areas that touch into the spiritual nature of the crisis that we're in. This requires a deep conversion, deep metanoia, deep change. And it's also the case that the mindset that created the problem isn't going to be the mindset that fixes it. You know, modernity is incredibly arrogant and it's the kind of arrogant that says, oh, we'll get the technology to sort this out. And there's something in our Christian faith that says, no, we need a much, much greater humility than this. And we need a change of mindset. And then I've also put up here um, that there's something here as well that really values the earth. It's a sacramental theology. It says the earth is sacred as created by God. God says the earth is good and it has intrinsic value. It's not just about instrumentalizing the planet in the way that we have done, even instrumentalizing it for climate change purposes. It says the earth is sacred fundamentally. And it, but it also, the bill, it embraces that complexity of thinking that I think we need. It resists perhaps fundamentalisms and ideologies. And actually, it's interesting, I can't find the diagram, but somewhere there is a diagram of how that citizens assembly would relate to Parliament that I think is quite important because it recognises it's complex. You know, it's not just one or the other. So it actually says actually how the citizens assembly relates to Parliament is a complex ongoing dialogue. And it talks about things like if the citizens assembly has agreement of 80 percent, that means that Parliament has to discuss it. So it's starting to get into the nitty gritty and complexity. And something that I would recommend you do if you haven't done, I have to say shamefully, I hadn't done this until recently, but I went on board the parliamentary website and I was kind of interested in looking at the kind of technicalities of how a bill would get through parliament. You can go on and you can see the whole process of a bill, how it actually gets through, all the committees it has to go through, the ways that businesses and interests can feed into that bill. It's a tremendously kind of complex negotiated process and we need to be aware of that. You know, we need to be able to see, and it's all there to see. You can see who's who's participating, how it's working. You know, complex dem democracy is complicated. It's messy. It involves complicated negotiations. We can't avoid it. So I think there's something here positively about embracing that complexity 
And I think there's something here profoundly about longer term thinking, you know, that we we have chronic short termism in our politics and our economics. It's a it's a really pathological part of the way that the West works now, pathologically short term. And as Christians, as people of faith, we embrace a much longer term vision. So it's really important. So those are some things that I think are really important and how this bill resonate, resonates, at least for me, theologically. But I think also the bill hints at something. Um, it nudges us towards something even a bit more. And so here I would say what, what the bill hints at, is this isn't in the bill, but I think it's what it points towards. It, the bill questions some of the underlying paradigms and unspoken assumption, assumptions that currently operate in our business as usual. And, uh, and so one of those, I think one of the big ones uh, is that the current assumption that the primary purpose of business is to extract profit and maximum value for shareholders. That's basically the primary purpose, but it's exploitative. And it's what climate change is saying and ecological is that it's actually destroying life itself. And I think as Christians, we have to, we have to re-engage with the language of this is immoral it's wicked and it's idolatrous. It's like the worship of Baal in the Old Testament where they sacrifice their children. You know, it's at that level, this model, this unspoken assumption that underlies current modus operandi. We've got to reclaim the language. We've got to name it. We've got to call it out. And I think I would really recommend this book, uh, Donut Economics. I'm a great fan of Kate Raworth. It's really easy to read, but as Christians, we've got to realize that economics is part of our theology. It's not just neutral. We have to start naming um, things uh, in theological language. Um, what it also, I think, starts to point us towards is we have a massive vacuum at the moment in our dialogue, in our political and in our social civic dialogue. We have a vacuum of values and vision for society. You know, what is all this material prosperity for? Is it just so we get more and more and more? You know, for heaven's sake, you know, we need a much deeper dialogue that goes beyond materialism and commodification. It means that we have to redefine what prosperity really is. What is true wealth? And I think someone like Tim Jackson in the University of Surrey, you can listen to a TED talk that he did about 12 years ago. It's fantastic, it's prophetic. And it's the way we as Christians, we need to be deeply engaged in that very, very much needed conversation. And I think it goes right to the roots of how we understand salvation, that fundamentally salvation is being brought into right relationship. That that's, that's what justice and righteousness means. It means right relationship. So at the core of salvation is an understanding that reality is relational. You know, we're not independent, autonomous individuals. We're called into relationship. And therefore salvation is the reconciling, healing and restoring of all things. It is fundamentally relational. It's about harmony and balance. And so that is there kind of in the background of this bill. And it deeply also relates to what it means to be human. You know, we're not just this reductive homo economicus that calculates its kind of self-interest. Human beings are much more complex <laughs> and wonderful than that. You know, that we're human beings in relationship. So we need to challenge the reductive assumption that underlies um, business as usual in terms of what it means to be human. And we also fundamentally need to say, this is about love, not fear. It's about working with rather than against nature. It's not objectifying nature, not seeing nature as stuff out there that we use. But it's also a belief that cre in creation, God has provided an abundance for us. That if we can only work with it, we'll understand that it's abundant, that there is enough. And we don't have to live in competition and scarcity, which is the kind of underlying mindset behind the modus operandi at present. So I'm just going to say really briefly what I think perhaps isn't emphasised enough in, in the bill that we as Christians might want to see emphasised. The bill can't do everything, but I think there is something about social justice implications and the impact on the poor. The bill does talk about justice and it does mention social inequality, but I think as Christians there's something that actually is going to be really challenging here around climate and ecological emergency. And... Um, 
and it affects both workers and consumers. And I'm just going to give a little quick example of what I think is an example of how this works. So let's look at the example of fast fashion just as one example, right? So the fashion industry is disastrous in its ecological and climate footprint. It needs massively to be rethought from top to bottom. At the moment, fast fashion is a disaster. However, if we were to just pull that rug now and say, oh, we've got to stop it, end Primark, you know, let's stop the fast fashion now, that would have drastic implications for all the workers in Asia, in Bangladesh, all those garment producers, many of whom are women, depending on this industry. Disastrous for them if we pull the rug, but also disastrous for the poor in our own country. You know, if we think back, poverty used to be defined by people in rags because clothes are so expensive. Clothes were the, were you know, the product that only the rich and the middle class could afford. You know, if you were poor, you could see it. So fast fashion, what it's done is it's given dignity to people. And we have to recognise that. You know, you can no longer easily just say someone's poor by their clothes. So if we, if we just end fast fashion, we're, we're putting clothing out of the price range of huge swathes of our population. So we have a massively complex, difficult issue. And I don't think that there's simple solutions to this. So I just want to say, you know, there are massive social justice implications in the issue of climate and ecological degradation. And I think we've got to be honest and we've got to say, how do we wrestle with this? How do we see the level of system change we need that doesn't produce greater inequality and has devastating effects on the poor? Right? I don't have the answer for that in fast fashion, but that's something we, that we've got to really wrestle with. Um, and then I think the bits and the bill can't do everything. OK, but as Christians, we'd want to say there are other vital components that are part of the picture, such as tax justice and debt relief. So I don't expect that to be in the bill. But I think as Christians, we need to say there are other vital components that are part of the picture that we cannot ignore. And I think also what's needed is we need to set the sea bill in the current context of legislation. So that means we need to be informed about the government's current of uh, the Tories environmental bill. They've got a 25 year vision. We do need to know about it. I think one of the scandals of our democracy and media is that we hear very little about the business of what actually goes on in Parliament. It's not on the news like the laws that are being made are not on the news, it's appalling. You have to really want to find out to actually know what is happening in Parliament. And um, so for me, one of the things that I've started listening to is Farming Today on Radio 4, because actually that's where you'll hear about the current agricultural and uh, environmental bill, because you won't hear it on mainstream news. So we've got a thing called environmental land management coming out of Brexit, could be a good thing, but it all depends on how well it's resourced. So we just need to know that we need to be informed about current, how the sea bill relates and is more radical so that when we have conversations with MPs and they go, oh, we've got an environment bill, we don't go, oh, and we, we're not equipped. Okay, so we do need to know what the current um, picture is. Phew, sorry, that was massively fast. And uh, I've raced through because I wanted to give us time to talk. And I've got two questions for us to discuss. Um, one is, so what's our strategy for change? With climate change increasing on the agenda, is the sea bill where we should be directing energy? So this is a strategy. Have we reached a point where through our direct action, we have changed the landscape? You know, climate change is now on everyone's lips, right? It might be superficial, but it's there. So are we looking at now this, are we at a new point of strategy? Are we at a new place where we need to direct more energy, perhaps in a different way, into this bill? Question mark. And the other question I've got is, this um, process will involve basically masses of conversations. It's about um, a process of engaging more and more people in a movement. Uh, where we really put the pressure on MPs, because at the end of the day, we'll say you're not going to win the vote if you don't support this bill. But to get that amount of pressure on MPs, we need to build huge alliances. So it involves thousands and thousands of conversations, basically, that start with family, friends, or all the groups we're part of, organisations, MPs. So the second question is, what do we need in order to engage confidently in these conversations? So those are the two questions that I would like us to discuss. And we've got 15 minutes. 
and then we can come back. So I realise we haven't got very much time. So I think maybe it's anyone who has a kind of really important question or an important reflection. Um, we'll just, Ruth, if you could help me, because it's across a number of screens or put stuff in the chat box as well. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. It's Dave. Um, oh. Yeah, fantastic. Oh. I mean, I was I was just saying in my group, I was like scribbling 100 miles an hour to try and get everything down. And I'm going to have to revisit that. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, one one thing that our group picked up on, and I don't know whether other groups did, is that does this present us with a bit of a kind of dichotomy, a bit of a dilemma? Do we focus 100% on nonviolent direct action, civil dis disobedience, protest in all those good ways? Or do we focus on the bill? You know, is there a kind of dichotomy there that might divide our energies that might get people asking, well, what are you into? Are you into this or that? You know, can you comment on that? So I don't have the answer. I think that's something we need to wrestle with. We, we talked about it in our group. You know, can we do both? Should we do both? I think it's a genuine question. I'm not going to try and answer it. I think we need to wrestle with it. Uh, the other person I was going to say is David Jenkins. <laughs> I think you had a question or a comment. Um, it's, it's a comment, but it can, uh, it, it can tip into a question easily enough. Um, it strikes me that um, one of the reasons that 2050 was chosen uh, as, a, a, as, as a target for the Green New Deal is that the technology just does not exist at the moment if you were going to take a corporate technical, a te technical solution to the problem. Um, and there's also the other aspect of that is whether consumer culture is able to adapt in, 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 in that kind of timescale. Mm. So for me, um, the question is not CEE bill or not, or C bill as I should now learn to say it or not, but what's the most effective way of undermining the corporate hegemony and consumer culture that really stands in the way of scale and urgency? Mm -hmm. um, because um, I, 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 I don't see the C bill, you know, sort of as, as the, only the only approach. No, no, it's not, you're right. I mean, I, maybe, yeah. I'll mute. So the thing I would say is as Christians, we've got to start talking about this. We've got to hit the mindset of our culture theologically in how we talk about what it means uh, to see the world from God's perspective. So we definitely as Christians need to talk more radically. And one thing I want to say is I think um, this isn't about dumbing down on a radical approach to the gospel and the kingdom of God. The church has been far too complacent and it's gone with the status quo. So while I might reject certain models of revolution, I think we need to be radical. And that's why I said we need to speak in much, much more challenging ways about the current, like you said, the kind of the way that we're thinking and living at the moment. Vanessa, Kate Rigby had, yeah. or was it one of the Kates had a question, but just before we get there, one of the the question, one of the um, things that you would say in a in a witness statement in court for being arrested for, for nonviolent direction would be the, all the other things you have done to raise awareness. So mm -hmm. absolutely lobby your MP, go and meet your MP. All this, all the information is there in the Green Christian website. I've just put the, the, um, the link on the chat, but then go and take direct action as well, is yeah. what I would say. And Kate. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Vanessa. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I've just got a fairly basic technical question. Um, is, is the bill due to be put towards to Parliament? Um, is there a date for that? Um, you know, and like something that we should be working towards in terms of gathering support for it, um, including, you know, um, trying to lobby MPs and so on? So my understanding is there is no date. It can easily just get shunted and shunted and shunted back. Right. So part of the pressure is to say, we need this to be debated. We've even yeah. got just to get to that point. So there's a yeah. battle just to get to that point. It's not a given. No, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, um, I was going to say that, obviously, I think probably most of us know that we are on schedule for passing the 1.5 degree mark 
probably in the next couple of decades. Um, and the government's own committee for climate change has highlighted the government's failings. Um, and I believe in the government's the own committee for climate change report says that the government should be preparing, and this is consistent with other scientific sort of reports, um, should be preparing for um, three to four degrees of warming uh, uh, global heating above pre-industrial levels by 20, 2100. Um, that's, the, that's the figure I'm seeing all over the place. And to put that in perspective, 1.5 degrees is already, 1.5 degrees is already catastrophe yeah. for much of the majority world. And I think in all that we do, I think we need to really, really hold that. It's very hard to even get our heads around, mm -hmm. I think, but we need to really somehow hold that in our thinking and all that we do. I think you're right. There's something about how do we keep that center stage mm. and where we're actually heading. Um, it's, it's sort of, and also that, you know, that the, it's that balance of not just being doom mongers, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but, but, actually saying this is super super urgent and what you're doing is not that's the thing we can get the Tories on they've got the aspirations but what they're doing is so inadequate yes. that that's where we've got to have the conversations you're talking the talk you've got the aspirations but your action is massively inadequate mm -hmm. Vanessa, there was someone in the chat who wanted to say something about nets. Okay, I'm looking. I'm trying. It's hard to follow the chat, and there's so much going on. <laughs> I can't follow it. Vanessa, it was me. It's Rebecca. Rebecca Warren. Oh, hi, Rebecca. Should, should I should I speak? Yeah, yeah. Please do. Hey, Kate. Um, well, you know, well, you know, and um, probably other people here know that I'm involved in several voluntary organisations, and one of them has has um got huge reservations about the bill. I mean, almost fundamental reservations because it is um, so open to nets. Now, you, you um, in your earlier presentation, you said it avoids or downsizes nets, I think, but there is a later version of the bill which um, gives them more emphasis. And so um, the, the organization, I don't want to get into the technical details, but the organization has basically um, has, has written to, to um, Caroline Lucas and um, Clive Lewis saying, um, ask them to take certain points out. Um, mm -hmm. And until then, they say they can't support the bill. My, my um, I wanted to draw to, to, um, to, to bring that point up to make sure people do know about it. However, I, I've got to say, um, I don't, I don't want to throw the bill out altogether. I just want to say, I, I, I am, um, I support it, but with massive um, qualifications. As, as, as it is, as it is, it could allow the some of the most um, da environmentally damaging um, company um, companies in the country a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Okay. That's that's an important point. I, that point. I, I, I thought I can't come to um, a presentation about the C bill without without Thank saying you. that. That's a really helpful point. Thank you. I, I mean, I do get what you're saying, and there are some massively damaging, like you said, the biomass stuff can be disastrous. Um, but I think I think if we are going to even try and stay within one point five or beneath two, we might have to accept some. Uh, negative emissions technologies until we don't need them. So for me, there is a reality check here. And there's a danger that like with all those people, you know, it's like the Greens just end up, we just end up infighting amongst ourselves and we miss this opportunity to come together. I think we have to come together. We need strength in numbers. Let's not, let's not fight on something that, yeah, might prevent this from happening. Anyone else I'm not seeing, sorry. Can I ask a question? Yes, who's that? It's Julie Bod. <laughs> Julie. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether um, if most many of us are in areas, well, the other offers, if you're saying that climate change is being sort of now at least acknowledged by others, is there um, a place for actually us being informed about the... Um, the concern, as you said, the 
we need to inform ourselves. Could we have a session on the Conservative Environment Bill and why it's not sufficient so that we can yeah. um, have well-backed factual reasons as to why the, um, the one that's more likely to get backing isn't. Um, so yeah, so we can challenge it effectively. Could we do that as CCA? I think Melanie's got a hand up. Do you want to respond to that, Mel? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, I put a link in the chat to the XR scientists who had a session on the CE bill with some very, very interesting speakers. And part of that is addressed in there, not in great, in great depth, but it's certainly worth watching that session, which is only about an hour um, long. And I'll yeah. find the link to the other one that, yeah, that is one. Sort of a, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the, the one with is, Caroline Lucas. The problem is it would be very boring, <laughs> tedious. But I think maybe this is partly what we need to embrace. You know, well, those of us that feel that this is something that we need to do. I think there's still a question around whether this is something that we as CCA put a lot of time and energy in. I don't have the answer to that, you know, but if we are going to engage with this, it's going to, it, it's quite, it involves getting hold of quite a lot of details. And it's boring on one level, if you're like me, <laughs> you just want to go to the juicy bits. But we are, I think there is an, ele I think there is an element in how do we equip ourselves to have these conversations. Someone in my group talked about how their MP just says, oh, this bill is never going to get anywhere. And I said, well, immediately you can come back and say, well, the Climate Change Act, that started in 2005 as a private member's bill. And everyone said this isn't going to get anywhere. But it did. It became a law in 2008. So we need to have these things that we can throw back when they say, oh, it's not going to get anywhere. We can say, well, that's what they said about this bill. So there is something about how do we equip ourselves to have these conversations? I think it's really important. So Vinice, can I just say that Green Christian um, link I've just put in there that has yes. the three, yes. that has all the videos that tell you about the CEE bill on there, easy to yeah. find. And it will have this one. Don't worry, it will have yes. this one. As and Rachel one. Meander is also somebody who is um, her role in something for the future is all hope about equip, the hope for the future is all about equipping people to have these conversations as well. So there are other resources out there. Um, Yes, yeah, she was involved in, write, in writing the page that links that website on writing to your MP. So if you want to write to your MP, I will put that link in now. And she, Rachel Manda from Hope for the Future was involved in that. So and I've just seen Rachel's, Rachel's comment about having practice sessions. And I think that's actually quite a good thing that maybe one of our, you know, we could set up some pretend sessions and practice this stuff. Because I think some people are really good at engaging. I, you know... Um, with the other, with people coming from very different, how do we engage people just so far off, the, you know, where we are? How do we travel that distance? How do we start to do that? I think that's that requires some skills. So we've reached twelve o'clock. Um, so I just I just want to thank you all. Sorry, it was so much so fast. I will make the slides available. Um, so you can have a look at the slides and um, and there are some notes that I need to just sort of tweak a bit, but um, I will make it available to you um, in some kind of written form as well.